John Hartson lays off the shot! John Hartson left the goal, which surely takes Celtic to the UEFA Cup semi-finals. I broke Arsenal's transfer record. I broke West Ham's transfer record. It's a lot to take in for a young boy from a council estate in Swansea. So one day uh, I showed it to my wife, I said, look at this, it's been there a while and she's like almost went like that, well, what on earth? And I said, I've not been to see anybody. She says, you need to go and see the doctor. And I never went. I never went to the doctor and I allowed it to spread. I allowed it through my ignorance of my own health. I'd always had an issue with gambling. I'd, I'd always loved gambling. And, and gambling is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in society. There's more people that take their life through gambling addiction than any other addiction. And I always think that you, you can't go higher than represent your country. Can't go higher. Because you're representing your nation, your heritage. Playing for Wales was my number one. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing and Neil McAvoy Law. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. Since the start of the podcast, there's been a few names that have been chucked in the recommendation list, and there's one that comes up consistently. Seeing as we brought you Joe Ledley and Craig Bellamy, now I think it's only right to complete the final boss of the Celtic Welsh trio. All too often we look at sports stars and athletes as invincible or untouchable, but in reality they're just like you and me, and even the big Johns of the world can face life or death situations. Through all his successes, this man has battled on all fronts, from gambling addiction to fighting cancer. He's the pinnacle of what we're trying to promote here at the Central Club, and I warmly welcome John Hartson. Thank you very much, great to be here. Thank you, John, for coming. I no really problem. Appreciate it. No problem. Pleasure. How's things, mate? Things are good. Um, I'm now currently living in Edinburgh, and of course, I'm I'm down for the next uh, ten days covering uh, covering two big games for Wales. Well, the big game is on Thursday night. You know, it's absolutely massive. The home game against Austria. You know, to think that we could go through to to play Scotland or the Ukraine. Uh, to think if we could get to a World Cup, what it would do for the for the Welsh football in general. You know, you look at the the academies and the youngsters now, and the Welsh team have got several young players coming through at the moment. It's a, it's a really good time um, for Robert Page to be in charge. He's got some really good talent there, and what it would do for them in terms of if they could reach a World Cup, I think it, the, the country would get a huge. Um, left from that, like the Euros, of course, and we did so well in 2016 in, in France. So Thursday night, got to go and concentrate on Austria first, win that one, hopefully, um, and then obviously we will we will probably play, uh, we will play either either Scotland or the Ukraine uh, in a couple of months' time. So, but first and foremost, we have to look at this game Thursday yeah. and make sure we win it. You say you're living up in Scotland now. What are your chances? You think if we go up against Scotland? Well, Scotland are better now, aren't they? They went, they got to the Euros there in 2021 as well as Wales. They were knocked out in the group stages. They've got some better players now. You know, you look at um, Callum McGregor, the the Celtic captain, wonderful midfield player, McTominay at Manchester United. Um, they've got Andy Robertson at <laughs> Liverpool, Kieran Tierney, Arsenal. Um, Ex Celtic, of course. Um, just some, just some good players now. You know, Lyndon Dykes, Jay Adams, who's uh, banging in goals at Southampton, and a couple more. Uh, Billy Gilmore, of yeah. course, who's Chelsea, but been on loan at Norwich. So they look, they look stronger under Steve Clark these days. Scotland. So they, listen, they'll fancy themselves. You know, if they, if they come up against Wales, um, like we will if we go up against them. So. Yeah. You know, I make it a 50-50 game. It's a one-off game. And I think whoever can play well on the night, you know, it's not as if you can try and look at tactics and get through the first game away from home and then you can have a look to to be more positive in a different game. You've got to leave it all out there. You you know, leave, leave it all on the pitch in that one-off game and the winners will go through to the World Cup. So. Yeah. Is there any... Um, have we come to some, like, 
agreement of what's happening with Ukraine, obviously, with what's going on over there now. Do we know if they'll be playing or...? We don't know. I think the game has been rescheduled for some time in June. Um, but I think with everything else, the conflict and um, what's going on in Ukraine, you know, obviously we all we all feel for for um, the Ukrainians and, and, and what's happening and the struggle that they're going through right now. Um, so really from their point of view, I would think that football would be the last thing that, yeah. that, that comes into anybody's minds. So... Um, but the plan is obviously for Scotland to play the Ukraine, whether the Ukraine will be ready in June to, to put that game on and release their players to go and play. We don't know. I think only time will tell. Um, if they can't fulfil the fixture, I would imagine Scotland would have a bye. And then the winners between Wales and Austria Thursday night will will play Scotland. But of course, um, you know, we don't know. We can't really look too far ahead because... Um, we don't know what what situation you know that's going to be in June. Yeah, I um talking on the subject of Scotland again. Um, I saw on 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 the headlines online on some of the the Rangers websites, the Celtic websites. You're in you're in the headlines again. Ticket allocations. What's your take on that? Well, what it is a, a good few years ago, um, Celtic were on the way to nine in a row, and Celtic used to take seven 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 and a half thousand fans away to Ibrox. And Rangers made the decision because they said that there was such a demand for season ticket holders um, to stop the away allocation and just put it down to 500. And and now, basically, I don't think that's particularly right. I just think that what it was, they weren't too keen on watching Celtic absolutely win all the time at Ibrox, celebrating, enjoying it. I think that's one of the reasons behind the fact that they cut... Celtic's allocation to such a low number and now they've offered Celtic 700 fans um, and I'm like well if I was one of those 700 fans I wouldn't want to go because there's so many other fans missing out you know um, so me having an opinion on everything you know I had to pipe up and say well I wouldn't be I wouldn't be taking them 700 uh, um, the allocation I want the whole stand or not or nothing Um and I think the fairest way to do it, personally, is to give Celtic 7,000 away fans and then when Rangers come to Celtic Park, Celtic actually give Rangers all their full allocation as well. You know, no no cuts, nothing to do with anything So was it, the, was it the same on the Celtic front where they were kind of... Well, Celtic playing. reacted yeah. to what Rangers did. Um, Rangers, There's never going to be a good outcome there. But then, Rangers maybe. did it first. So then okay. why on earth then would Celtic allow Rangers more fans when Rangers... Did, You're not going to, are you? Rangers did this first. That's that's a fact. That's not me making this up. Yeah. Um, so now it's a case of uh, whether or not Celtic accept that amount of uh, away fans and what they do then when Rangers then go to Celtic, which will also um, be probably at the end of April before the split because the, the, the two teams are split. The two teams will go into the split, which means the last five games of the season and um, they will play, they've got a semi-final of a Scottish Cup to play, and they've still got two more league games up against each other. So Celtic <laughs> at this current time, um, there are three points ahead. Top of the league, yeah. Yeah, I think they're 14 goals ahead, which is almost theoretically like a point. Big difference here, isn't it? Yeah, but, uh, but Rangers is in their own hands, it's in Celtic's hands. I think whoever go, go and win these big, uh, these big derby games will put themselves in a great position. You going for Celtic this season? Celtic this season, I think uh, Ange Postecoglou has been excellent. I think Celtic uh, have improved so much since since last season where Rangers romped it. They were the better team. Um, they, were, they did ever so well. Uh, they only conceded, I think it was 12 or 13 goals all season. They were invincible as they didn't lose. Um, and uh, and for me, I just think what Ange Postecoglou's done, he's built a, almost a, a new team from goalkeeper Joe Hart right the way through to the um, Japanese centre-forward, Kyogo. He's added some really good players. And to think that Rangers were in the ascendancy, if you like, they won the league by 25 points last season. And to think of the turnaround, really, Gerard did amazingly yeah. well, stopping Celtic going, Celtic going for 10 in a row. You have to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, but then what Celtic have achieved this season by bringing in Ange, it, it was... It was um, um, they had to bring him in as a man. Not many people had heard of uh, Ange. No. Uh, we were all a little bit ignorant on that fact. 
But uh, he's Benham kind of, was talking about him, weren't he? On you yeah. about company was trying to, they were trying to get him in at Andelect or something, weren't they? Is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, did, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, but uh, no, he's done a wonderful job. You know, he's re really has. Um, yeah, fair play. He's galvanised everything, and you know, he's really united Celtic again. Mm. The fans have come together, and that's what you need with these clubs. Everybody's got to be together, you know, all the time. And uh, Celtic certainly have been this yeah. season. I've seen you were. Uh, you said something a couple of months ago as well, that Gerard weren't going nowhere. Was you surprised that Gerard went? Well, I said that Brendan Rodgers wouldn't go nowhere. Um, <laughs> the difference with me is people tend to go, oh, I'm not quite sure. The difference with me is I go, this is what'll happen. Yeah. This is what'll happen. I either get it wrong or I get it right. You're not quite sure. You're always going to no, be quite right, I, aren't you? I, I'll, tr I'll give my view and I'll, I'll say what I think at the time. Maybe it's a bit unwise um, and then you get hammered for it. But the problem is, if you get it right, nobody says, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Nobody says, oh, by the way, you you, you absolutely nailed well, that. Or, you nailed that. What they'll say is, oh, by the way, you got that completely wrong. And I've got three, 400,000 followers on, on Twitter. <laughs> so it's just... So I spend half my morning just going block, 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 block. Mm. That, that's social media. I could come off it tomorrow, but I don't know, you know why I'm on it, really. Well, I think that's something I've seen you talk about before is... With all the good people do in their lives, they will always remember the bad. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same with like when you was at West Ham, all them great goals you scored. Mm. The one thing they always talk about is the training ground kick. Absolutely. And it's like, it's like for instance, Roy Keane. Look at Roy. You know, people talk about the Alfinger Haaland situation. Roy won so many league titles. <laughs> what a, one Immense. of the best players the Republic of Ireland I've ever had. Um you know, they talk about the fact that he had issues with his country when he, when he walked out to the, from the World Cup. And these things take tend to take the headlines, mm. you know, uh, rather than talk about... And it's... I feel this right. I think a lot of people revel in other people's misdemeanours. Cantona, you know, a fly kick, that's it, all they exactly remember. Exactly right. And, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm, I, I give my opinions. Um, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I think the majority of people would rather see you give an opinion, you know, put yourself out there, really. If you have an opinion, then voice it. If you, if you don't have an opinion, then in lots of people have newspaper columns, you read it and you go, well, what's he actually said? <laughs> he said a lot, but actually not said anything, you know. I think when you've got a column, you've got to get people talking in the pubs, get people talking about your column in the bookies, Get people talking about your column on other radio shows. You know, by the way, what about what? What did he say? And that's what that's what paper editors they want. Oh, yeah. They they want you to talk about things. You know, and, and big topics as well. So, listen, I I got no regrets on that front. Sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I get it right. So, um, you know, I'm I'm quite happy with that. All right, and let's take it back a bit then, John, for the people, I'm sure everyone knows who Big Bad John is, but for the people who don't know, you are our first Swansea boy. Can you take it back to a, a young John Arton in Swansea? Yeah, growing up in Swansea, um, actually born in Neath, um, but um, obviously lived in Swansea. Uh, I was obsessed with football. My father played Welsh League level. Uh, my dad played for Ammonford, played for Bridgend, played for St. Athletes. My dad was a good footballer at that Sort of level, found his level. So that's where the gene come from, I suppose. I would go with my dad on the team bus and uh, things like that. You know, he'd play cards on the way home. They'd get one of the seats up and then they'd sit around. The, the seats would go across the seat. They'd lift the seat up and they'd put it right across. So they got the flat area yeah. in, in the space of the bus, you know. Um, and they'd all gather around. They'd all be playing cards. There'd be a bit of money sort of flying about as well and... My dad sometimes would lose the money and I'd see him pick up a little brown envelope after the game and he'd go home and my mother would say, you get paid today, love? And he'd go, oh, no, I didn't get paid today, love. And I'd say, man, dad received the brown envelope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd hang him, like, you know, but uh, no, great days watching my dad play, going all around the country, Averford West and all these places. So, um, you know, I, I quickly started playing football. My school didn't have a football team because I went to a Welsh-speaking school, as probably you know, I'm a fluent Welsh speaker. And the number one sport in Wales is rugby, isn't it? You know, and our 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 school didn't... Especially down then, we. Yeah, well, our school, we didn't have a football team. The headmaster was totally against having a football team. And um, so then I started playing outside the school. At um, 10 years of age, there was a Luton Town scout from Newport, sorry, from Merthyr, um, called Cheryl Beach, 
Uh, he was watching me play. And then he invited me up to Luton um, for trials during the school holidays and my progression then just went, you know, we used to go on the holidays. My father would put me on a train at Swansea. I'd come up to Cardiff um, and then I'd meet Mark Pembridge, Kerry Hughes, um, Andrew Dukes, Jason Rees. Um, so I'd meet a few of the older boys, but only two or three years older, and they would take care of me then. And that's who we're up there as well. At the Going time. up to Luton. Um, my dad would give me a, a 10 and it'd be all in coins. I can remember him putting his hand in his pocket because oh, we're talking 30 years ago and I'm 46. This is what, what, 35 years ago when I was 11, 12 years of age. Um, it was quite funny because that my dad used to say to Mark Pembridge, hey, make sure you look after John now today. So, uh, and then when obviously we both went on to play for Wales, it was me that was looking after him, you know, on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pembo and Kerry, you know, and uh, so I loved those days going up to Luton in the school holidays. And then uh, at 14 years of age, I actually got offered um, a YTS scheme, like an apprenticeship. Yeah. £29.50 um, to go to Luton when I was 16, when I left school. So straight away, that, um, that obviously was great because... Most of us will have children, and uh, the one worry, I've got five, I've got five children now, and the one worry, I think, not so much worry, but the one thing um, that 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 I think about quite a lot is what are they going to go on and do with their lives, you know, what what are they going to do, are they going to go to college or university, are they gonna, just going to come out to school, because they, they know love, they're so much different, aren't they, children? But the one thing that, that pleased my parents was the fact that I was going to Luton at 16. I'd had something, cemented, to, yeah. I'd had something to focus on, you know, um, at 16 years of age. So they were quite pleased about that. And uh, I went up to Luton. And as they say, I, I really sort of made a big impact on a football club when I was there early on. Got into the first team at 18. Went to Arsenal then at 19 for, for record money. I was Britain's most expensive teenager was it? at the time, yeah. So that was a huge deal for How me. How did that feel for you, like, you know? But when you're young and when, when you're 19, you you don't really take it in too much. It was, I, was, I was in a bit of a bubble, to be honest with you, because when you're, when you're 19, you, you, you're not scared of nothing, are you? You know, you, you've got plenty of spunk, you've got plenty of energy, you've got plenty of desire... I was aggressive. I'd run through a wall to win the tackle. Um, you know, and the one thing I used to do when I was called over to play with the first team, I would go and smash the centre halves, and I could, <laughs> I could see David Pleat on the sideline go, "What have we got here? He's a madman," you know. Um, but that was one of the ways that you get on. You know, you go and show people that you got no fear. Um, and if anything else, I think when you get a bit older, you, you worry a bit more whether you whether you've still got it. Yeah. You know, you know you've got the legs, you know you've got the energy, the the youthfulness. Um, so I wasn't that concerned. I went to Arsenal at 19. It was a wonderful move for me. Um, went into that dressing room, George Graham signed me, and you've, you've got the England back four there, you know, Tony Adams and Keown, Dixon, Winterburn, Seaman, Burkamp, Wright, all these great, great players. Unbelievable. So George says to me, he says, John, he says, Alan Smith and Kevin Campbell have both got injured this morning, the day I was going to sign. He said, if you sign for me today, he says, you'll play with the England centre forward tomorrow out there on Highbury, of yeah, course, right. which was which was right here. Yeah. So then as time went on, George George got uh, relieved from his job, Arsene Wenger come in, and there were times where me and Wrighty would play up top and Dennis would play in the hall. Um, but then... Um, over the course of the next few weeks and months, we quickly realised that Wrighty and Dennis were really linking up well. And uh, and then my game time become a little bit less than what I would have liked because uh, Wrighty was exceptional and Dennis was just a genius, you know, genius, Dutch, you know, absolute magician. And um, I got offered the chance to go to West Ham. At 21, I had two years at Arsenal, played in two major cup finals. The scored in one of them, didn't you? Yeah, scored in the cup winners' cup final against um, Zaragoza. Gus Poy was playing that night in, Fran in in Paris at the Parc de France. And I played in the Super Cup final when I first arrived at Arsenal because AC Milan had won the European Cup you went, and yeah. Arsenal had won the cup winners' cup. So, um, and Alan Smith was injured. He had a problem with his ankle or his knee. And I went in and played both of them games against AC Milan, which is a great experience. Yeah, I'm course. 19. 
the back four was Baresi, Costa Curta, you know, Maldini. So I'm 19 years of age and I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to take all this you know, just on board, but I'm going from week to week, just playing, just getting on with it, finding a house, um, you know, just trying to settle. Uh, but then before I knew it, I was um, I had a great move to West Ham. Harry Redknapp came in and, and signed me, broke the record there again, 3.2 million at 21. And um, I had a great spell at West Ham when I first arrived there, you know, with Paul Kitson. Um, we we um, we helped West Ham not get relegated that year, uh, along with the likes of Young Rio and Frank and and Joe Cole. Again, and another br- another great team, another brilliant great young team. team yeah, like. brilliant team. We had footballers like Ian Bishop and John Moncur. You know, Stevie Lomas. We signed from Man City. He's a Man City captain when we got him, and we had a really good run uh, that year uh, at West Ham. It was a brilliant club. The fans are incredible, East End of London. Um, and then I stayed there for two years at West Ham. And then I eventually went to Wimbledon in 1999 for 7.5 million, which today is like, what, 23 years ago. That's over 100 million today. That's quite... A, isn't that mad? Are you just... Well, I was going on. I, I'm, I'm, 20, I'm 21, 22 years of age now, and I've been in London four or five years. And I've... I broke Arsenal's transfer record. I broke West Ham's transfer record, and I broke Wimbledon's transfer record. And you've gone north. And I'm 23 north. years of age. It's a lot to take in for a young boy from a council estate in Swansea. Do you know, I was living in London, and uh, and then had a couple of seasons at um, at Wimbledon with uh, with Joe Kinnear and Sam Herman, of course. Um, That's they, mad, isn't it? They pulled up the money to, to get me for that amount of money. Um, great time at Wimbledon. Fantastic uh, period. I remember we, we played Liverpool and um, Joe Kinnear came in the dressing room, our manager at Wimbledon. So he's, he's, he's looking at the Liverpool team and his team talk is like, unless like um, uh, Liverpool's goalkeeper has an absolute stinker today, he said, um, unless Ian Rush misses four setters, he said, and, and unless Steve McMahon falls over every time he has a ball. Joe Kinnear said, we got absolutely no fucking chance of winning today. Like, so talking about positive team talks. Um, it was all about how bad they done. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember I remember seeing Vinnie Jones at the back of, at the, back of the dressing room and Vinnie was like, you know, his, 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 uh, and Joe Kinnear said, he said, Vinnie's son, he said, my captain, he said, I want you to mark a great player for them today. So Vinnie's gone, yeah, right, so Vinnie's like, you know, it's, it's is a vein in his neck and, <laughs> and his arms are there. He's got tattoos showing. He's standing at the back of the. He's actually standing on the bench, not sitting like everybody else. So he's like that. And then Joe Kinnear says, I want you today, son. He said to Mark, <laughs> Steve McMahon. So then he turned around. He said, What, for life, boss, or just a game? <laughs> what was he like, Vinny? He's brilliant. He's a godfather to my daughter, Vinny. Um, and actually, when I arrived at Wimbledon, he, he was just leaving. He was just leaving the club. I think he went and done a bit of coaching, and then obviously he's doing brilliant now in LA. With the, he's made about thirty films now. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. only several. Like Brad Pitt's made two hundred films. These guys are constantly filming. That's all they do. And there's only so many films that actually hit the box office. Rise of the Foot Soldier one was good. When he was yeah, on yeah. I, I like the boy. Uh, is it Craig Fairbrass? Fairbrass. Is that a great he's actor. Bad, brilliant. Yeah, great actor. Um, so yeah, Vinny was good. Uh, we got friendly, very friendly at once. My wife was very friendly with Tanya as well, uh, Vinny's late wife, of course. That's such a shame when I Yeah, been, it's yeah. awful. Yeah, I knew Tanya very well. She was a lovely lady. Um, so uh, yeah, we were f- big friends at one stage. I, I actually learned him, to, uh, I taught him the Welsh National Anthem. Yeah, is he, well. proud of, is, he, is, is he proud of his Welsh heritage? He's Everything he does, he gives 100%. You know, he's unique in that sense. 
If you ask Vinny to go into 10-pin bowling tomorrow, he'll become the world champion within six months because he'll do it every day, every hour, every opportunity. He he will stick to something and he wants to make it a success. How can you think that Vinny Jones, born in Watford, played for Wheelstone, went on and won an FA Cup? You know, how can you think that he took a chance, went to LA and he's featured in some of the great British films that, that we've seen in the recent era? It's it's incredible, really, and you need you need desire, you need character, you need attitude to do these things. You know, yeah, and he's course. got all, he's got all them things. Um, so credit to him, you know, for doing that. Uh, he was a better footballer than what people give him credit for. Played for Chelsea, played for Leeds United, won a won a Premier League title with Leeds United, and Golden Strike. And you people know, don't so, look at him like a baller at all. No. Do they? Um, so captain a lot of teams, uh, put the fear of God into a lot of people on the pitch, you know, really, really aggressive, mean. Um, so iconic yeah. iconic photo. Yeah, I know. Like guys. Gaza, yeah. But no, no, I mean, he was great. I and mean, he was great for that period of time, you know, we, we were together. Just quickly, as we're on the Wimbledon one, what's your opinion on Sam Haman? Sam was great. To me, I think the, the crazier things you did, the better contract he'd give you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was that type of era. Um, we had some. We had Ben Thatcher. We had Andy Roberts. We had Marcus Gale, Sully in goal. Myself, Carl Court. So we had we had good players. Uh, unfortunately, we got relegated. Um, we brought Eggy Olsen in, the Norwegian manager, um, who liked the long ball and did very very well with Norway in World Cups. Liked to go long, but Sam was brilliant. I remember meeting him in his in his apartment in um, in St John's Wood to sign for him and I couldn't believe they were paying 7.5 million pounds for me because that, that was just remarkable in that nobody went for that type of money you know um, but Wimbledon I think were having a real go I think there, there was ambition there to go and sign other players as well uh, but I got on great with Sam you know I think when uh, when I managed to play against Cardiff once or twice and Sam was on the other side you know, running Cardiff or chairman, whatever his role was at Cardiff. Um, he would always come in the dressing room for the away. I didn't play there a lot. I think it was West Brom. I played there. And when I played against Cardiff at, at uh, Sellers Park in the cup game once, I missed a penalty. Um, Sam would always come in and make a bit of a fuss. We, we always had that little bit of a close link together. And Sam, Sam was great with me. He As remembers, I said, he forked 7.5 out on you. Yeah, well, there you go. So I, I can't really speak. I, I don't know the full what happened with Cardiff and everything else. Um, I like the guy I do. I yeah, he's a great, well, I, I great got, on, got on well with Sam. I didn't ever had any issues with him. He's better than the, the owner we got there now, put it that way. No, oh, well, there we are, as I said. So, no, Sam was fine. You know, he gave me a decent contract as well, so I'll never, never forget him for that. <laughs> <laughs> so from Wimbledon, mm. you went up to probably... Um, you probably played your greatest football up there. You you moved to Celtic then. By all accounts, you, you was meant to sign for Rangers before that, weren't you? Can you yeah. tell us what happened there? Yeah, I failed a medical. I failed four medicals in my career. Um, I went to Coventry for a short spell. Yeah, sorry. In between Wimbledon and eventually getting the move over the line with uh, with Celtic. I failed a medical at Glasgow Rangers. I was I was playing for Wales. Um and a telegram come through to the reception uh, that Rangers would like to speak to John Hartson over a, like a £6.5 million move to Glasgow to sign for Rangers. They put on a, um, a private jet for me uh, down at Cardiff Airport. Uh, I was flying up to Glasgow Rangers in Sir David Murray's private jet. I phoned my father. He came up to meet me. Mark Hughes gave me permission to miss the game that particular weekend. We fly to Glasgow, fly to Glasgow Airport go along to Ibrox and uh, go in the dressing room, discussed all the terms with Sir David Murray. And um, I was signing for Glasgow Rangers. At this particular time, I had no allegiance. Celtic Rangers, I knew they were two big, massive clubs. I was um, twenty. I was 26 years of age. And um, as far as I was concerned, as soon as we'd agreed the terms, I went along to a local hospital for a scan on my knee. Dick Advocat was their manager at the time. And I came back and the contract's there and I grabbed the pen and then they had a big um, Dutch doctor that were working for them, the Rangers official doctor. And he came in and he almost just said, look, there's something unfortunately shown up on John Scans at the hospital. There's a real problem with his knee. And um, my advice to you, Mr. Advocate, the manager would be, we can't, we can't take John because of this. It's too much of a risk. 
remember it was it was a lot of money, six point five million. Uh, back in two thousand, two, the year two thousand, so twenty two years ago yeah, now. Millennium. And then, uh, and then obviously I'm back on the private jet, back down to Wales, and I failed a medical at, at Rangers. And six months later, Martin O'Neill gets in touch. I'm with Coventry doing pre season training up at St Andrews in the student dorms there, in the university, and Gordon Strachan. Um, it was actually brought his phone down to the back of the bus. I said, somebody's on the phone to speak to you, and it was Martin O'Neill. And he said, look, John, I know all your situation with your medicals. He said, you failed four medicals at Spurs, Charlton under Alan Kirbisley. Spurs, George Graham was signing me again at Spurs. Failed that medical because of my knee. And then um, Martin said, look, he said, unless you've got a hole in your heart, he said, I'm going to sign you. So straight away... It, 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 it was ridiculously yeah. reassuring because... At this particular time, I, I was starting to question myself whether I could go through a medical. 26 years of age, I'm doing all the training, all the striking the ball. My knee was sound as far as I was concerned. But when you look at a scan, there can be something that shows up on the scan. It's like if you scan any goalkeeper's backs, their discs and everything else might be all over the place because they're constantly diving around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I I say to this day, if it had been 150 grand or half a million or something, then it probably wouldn't have been so stringent with it. Yeah. The fact is, it's it's huge money. It's money. wages. It's a five year deal. The club are investing a lot of money in yeah. you as a player. So I can almost understand if the, if the scans are not looking too great. So then I I went on to sign for Celtic, and I had a remarkable time uh, for Celtic. I scored over 100. I scored 110 goals. Um, Craig Bellamy came on loan and me and Craig performed that that partnership again, you know, that we'd had for Wales and at Coventry. So it was great to see Bellas coming up and did really, really well. And I think Martin wanted to sign him, but he was on, I think he was monstering what our our top player was yeah, on. Yeah. So we, we just couldn't get him over the line in the end. Um, and as I said, I did very well then against strangers, you know, so... It was always something that the fans would say, look, when you score or if you score, go and run to the Rangers fans and rub your knee or something. And I could never do that. I always thought, well, my, my goals, <laughs> I never did it. I never antagonised it or nothing like that. So I just got on with it and let my enjoyed let my football do the talking as such. And, you know, we, I had a great five years. I, I think we won three titles. We lost a title by a goal. And we lost the title by a point. And the title we lost by a goal, our front three that day was Hearts and Sutton Bellamy. And we got beat to Motherwell 2-1 and Rangers went and got the job done at Hibs. And they nicked it on the last day. Uh, it was like a helicopter Sunday, they call it, where the 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 the, um, the trophy, the league trophy was in a hot, in a helicopter. And it's waiting to drop in And it was team. parked, you no know, halfway in between and all of a sudden it's at Celtic and it's, at, it's, it's you the, know, it's swaying. The blue and green. Abs absolutely, teams. yeah. So uh, it ended up anyway going to Easter Road where Rangers pipped us to the title. We lost at Motherwell. Um, so at that particular time, you know, uh, but Celtic was a great place for me, you know, to, to play. Uh, I really enjoyed the success up there. Loved Glasgow, really embraced the city, and obviously I'm, I'm back in Scotland now, living in Edinburgh. I've been up there six years past there, past Christmas there. It was six years. I What's, love it up there. What was it like to score at an old firm derby? Well, it's incredible, I think. I think it's every young Celtic or Rangers kid's dream, isn't it? No, I know I'm not Scottish, but still when you represent one of these two huge global clubs, um, it was very special, and I managed to do it in four consecutive derbies. <laughs> Um, so it's incredible because you know that the feeling you get because a derby game, it's like it's only a derby and it only means anything in relation to where you're from. Like people who live in Norwich, their big game is Ipswich. Ipswich. If you're from the Midlands and you're you're a Wolves supporter, Wolves. It's, it's West Brom. It's the Black Country derby. Swansea, you know, you know Swansea, Cardiff. They're not overly bothered about what happens in Scotland, really. No. You know, yeah, they'll fall. They want to, some clubs will have a, a particular club somewhere else. Some a rival. Because some yeah. people think city, it's got to be in the city, don't they, some people? Yeah, but as I said, it's only in relation to the, the old firm derby, the Celtic Rangers derby, they're saying it now. Um, but for me, it was a case of I knew once I got that goal, 
you immediately you were taken to by the supporters because you did it in the big games, you know. And I was lucky; I, I managed to get the goal at the New Camp. I scored against Liverpool, Vigo, which took us through Europe for the first time in twenty years on the way to Seville in two thousand and three. Well, I, I had a back operation. Unbelievable goal. I, I never played in the UEFA Cup final. Jose Mourinho's Porto beat us. Um, so I had a few, you know, downers as well while I was at Celtic, but in, the majority of it was was positive. Um, but I knew once I got that goal and I won the game for Celtic, I knew all around the globe, all the Celtic supporters in America, in North Carolina, in Vancouver, in Canada in Swansea, in bloody New, whatever. You know, Celtic and Rangers, global institutions. So I knew I'd made the green half, I'd made the Celtic fans happy for that particular day because the fans loved the derby games. I was walking in Tembe the other week with my, with my son and the Cardiff City for, supporter came up to me. He said, you know, we're going to give you an idea on the 2nd of April, John, don't you? I was like, yeah, all right, yeah, all right, man, yeah. I probably won't watch it, I said, because I live in Edinburgh now unless it's on Sky, you know. But, uh, you know, it's always there. And will you watch it? I will watch it, yeah. I definitely will watch it. If I'm not watching it, I'll be on the phone to one of my pals how they're getting on. But, uh, and it's like everything else. I, you know, I, I think you got to look at the likes of Craig and you got to look at Joe Ledley, um, Cardiff boys, ex-teammates of mine. And when you're playing together, you just put it all to bed. You just play together. You're just trying to win for your team. But as much as, as, much as Craig and Joe at ex Cardiff, they don't want Swansea to win anything. It's rivalry. You yeah. know, do you think Steven Gerrard really wants Man United to win anything? Do exactly. you know what I mean? Do you want to think Lee Lennon, who's an Irish Catholic, you know, from Lurgan, does he want Rangers ever to win? And that that's the way normally when you've got a player that supports a particular club, they've always got a rival that, you know, that they want Territory, to beat. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So but no, um, going back to the, the, the Celtic and Rangers games, uh, it's fantastic to play in them. Uh, they're incredibly games, wonderful atmospheres. But then if you can go and get the winner, which I managed to do on a few occasions, this makes you feel great. I'm just glad you never got to play in that South Wales derby, so I never got to see any of them. John Arton winners, do you know what I mean? I would have. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's the one thing I'm yeah. glad. Do you ever regret that you never played in the South Wales derby? Um... I'd love to have played in it. Obviously, you know, growing up a Swansea City fan, and I know what it means to the fans and the Cardiff City fans on the other side. Uh, you have your heroes, and all, and I played at the um, the Ninian Park quite a few times, and I've uh, got a bit of stick. Obviously, a little <laughs> bit of stick. I, I've we was that at Luton, is it, and West Brom? No, and... Luton, West Brom, and one or two others. I think I played. Um, I played against uh, Cardiff for Wimbledon. And listen, it's only half what you expect. You know, I, I said a few things a, a bit naive when I was when I was 19, you know, a little few hand gestures to the crowd and we, when we won and things like that. But I was 19. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you're a little bit... You don't know what the future's going to hold. But I've got to say, in terms of relationships with, with the Cardiff City fans, um, I, I would probably say I think they were very good to me when I went through my cancer battle. Um, I had loads and loads of fan mail, um, you know, telegrams, letters, flowers sent to the Swansea Hospital where I was at, wishing me good luck, you know. And and that's football, you know, that, that tends to put rivalry to, to one side, you know, when someone's ill or when somebody loses their life. And I have to say I was very, very grateful for that, um, you know, for the support that they showed me as well as other clubs maybe that, you know, I never quite got on with the away with the opposite supporters, Rangers. You know, Spurs. Um, when I played for Arsenal, you know, the Spurs fans were very encouraging and everything else. So that was very kind. Very, you know, I'll always appreciate that. You know, yeah. Swansea supporters and and I think everybody comes together. You know, when when there's somebody fighting for their life, like I was. Let's talk about that then. When was the? Because I heard that you was pretty ignorant to this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're assuming you're a, you're a fit young man. You know, you're very active. This couldn't happen to you. You know, mm -hmm. big John Arton on the field. Like, how did this come across? And and how long was it before you got seen? Well, at first, um, probably uh, when I in 2008. Um, it was a few years before that. Probably about 2004, 2005. Oh. Um, 
I first come into contact with a little lump on one of my testicles. And it was only a small little lump, but I was continuing to train every day. I was fathering children. I was scoring goals. I was, I was doing everything asked of me. And then over the years, three or four years later, when I got to about 2008, um, when I'm playing for West Brom under Brian Robson, uh, it got a bit larger. You know, it went from like a, a little sort of nut-sized lump probably into like a, um, a Malteser and then eventually like a grape. So it, it was growing. It was on one of my testicles. Wow. So one day uh, I showed it to my wife. I said, look at this. It's been there a while. And she almost went like that. Well, what on earth? And I said, I've not been to see anybody. She says, you need to go and see the doctor. You need to go and see the doctor at West Brom to go and see about getting that looked at in terms of going to uh, for a scan or something. You need to be referred, you know, to go. And I never went. I never went to the doctor. And I, I told her like a little lie. I said I'd been and it was all fine. And so subconsciously, uh, I think I knew that there was something um, sort of brewing slowly. Um, and um, and then eventually uh, I started to have headaches. The headaches would, um, because the, the cancer was all of a sudden, it, it was spreading, spreading to my lungs and onto my brain and and I, I put a lot of weight on at the time. Um, and my wife used to say to me, I can't believe how much you're sleeping. You know, you're sleeping for coming home from training and laying on the settee and sleeping for hours and hours on end, you know. So something just not right. And even when I used to go up to the, the traffic lights, you know, I was dropping off, you know, and it, it just wasn't normal, you know. So eventually then um, I moved to Swansea and... Um, there was one particular day where my, my headaches were so bad. They were like your worst migraines you could ever think of. You know, I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't face the light. And my sister came to the house to see how I was feeling. And um, she rushed me down to Singleton Hospital. And then I spent I spent the next six weeks um, in hospital uh, fighting for my life. In and out of uh, surgery. I had two brain operations. I was, uh, I was desperately ill, you know, and uh, at one stage... Somebody told me from the BBC that towards the end, almost on my time, they were asked to write my what, what's it called? Are you when you Your grievance type of thing? Yeah, when you die, they write your little a little, little column. Like a message and stuff. Isn't yeah, it? and uh, they were asked to do that because I was so ill and uh, just to put statements out and stuff. Fuck you know. So it's come really, really close because I I'd allowed it to spread and it was on my brain as well. I had two emergency brain operations, one there, one round the back. Literally saved my life, and and how I got through it, I don't really know. Um, it's it's hard to explain um, how you get through that in terms of, you know, because a lot of people die of cancer, and it, it's horrific. Um, it takes so many good people away from us, you know. And I was blessed; I was one of the lucky ones to come through. Um, and how I come through, I don't really know. Did the doctors say at all, this is the reason why you come through it? Like, is it maybe because you're a big lad or no, they didn't give you no, nothing like that? No, no, no. I, I put it down to luck. I think the chemotherapy had a, had a big reaction to my body. Um, you know, the cancer ward there, the 12th, uh, the 12th floor in Singleton Hospital um, is where I spent all my time, literally, that cancer ward amongst other cancer patients. And I was I was able to come through that. And uh, at That's one amazing. at one stage, I remember my, my parents saying to me that the oncologist has said to them that we're extremely worried about John's situation. So from a parent's point of view as well, um, I remember my first, my brain operation, um, the seven-hour operation, it was just there, that one there, it was a seven-hour operation. I came out of the theatre with a bandage around and there was a bit of blood on the end of the bandage there. So my mother and father were there and they said to John Martin, Dr. John Martin, they said, how did it go, John? You know, how did the surgery go? And his reply was, oh, just a bit of plumbing, Mr. Hudson, just a bit of plumbing. And they're remarkable people, these surgeons. You know, they just saved my mother and father. They just saved their son's life. But he's doing three or four of these every day, you know, and it's just they're just incredible people doing their job, being as professional as they are. And then slowly, uh, over the next few months, weeks, I had to go into a chemotherapy sort of program where I'd go down three days a week. And that just knocked the wind out of me, you know, in terms of chemo, 
makes you feel sick. Um, it just zaps your energy. You can't eat these type of things. And and I lost about six or seven stone. I went I went from seventeen stone to like eleven stone or something like that. I was literally so frail. Um, so over the next few months, then they gave me some like a like a a plas- like a banner to sort of keep stretching, and I had some weights, and I'd sit in my house. I just just try and get my you know bit of strength back and things like that. And over a bit of time, it came back. You know the strength came back, and uh, and I was able to come through that. So that that was in two thousand and nine. Now, so we're talking, you know, eleven, twelve years ago. So, but I was very fortunate, and it it's totally changed me now as a person. I've got to be honest; it really has. It's 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 the simple things in life now that yeah. you know that I appreciate. It's time with my children, and walking along a beach, and sucking in the fresh air, you know, the use of your arms and your legs and your health. And I'll often be walking and I'll think to myself, you know, this is, it's a God given, isn't it? This fresh air, it doesn't cost nothing. You know, the use of your arms and your legs. And when you're, when you're in a hospital bed for six weeks, in and out of consciousness, being rushed down to theatre and everything else. And uh, it was a difficult time, but as I said, I was very blessed and appreciative to come through that. Yeah, it's amazing. You know the um the, the testicular was so was was it testicular cancer? It was testicular start? cancer that spread to my lungs and onto my brain because I'd allowed my testicle to eventually form a tumor on the edge of one of my testicles, and then cancer spreads up, cancer spread up to my lungs, and in the end, I had over seven hundred cancer markers on my body. Did they have to remove your testicle for yeah. that then? And yeah, you have to remove the testicle. So And then blast the raid. You had to get the chemo after the brain operation. No, it well. doesn't really. I think the testicle was removed, but the testicle was pretty much, you know, not working anyway by that stage. But, uh, you know, what, what eventually happens is that I could either have another prostate testicle put in for the balance, or I could just live with the one testicle, yeah. you know, so... That carries a little um, small minor operation. Um, so no, I, I was just so delighted to get out to hospital, and yeah, I'm obviously yeah, get yeah. get the not so much the all clear because cancer can strike anybody at any time, and I know more about I know about that than anybody else. Um, but it's I just feel that if any, if 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 women feel a little lump in their arm or in their, they're straight to the doctor. It's, it's a man thing, isn't it? Yes, it is a man if thing. If you have a headache or whatever, you got a bad leg or bad hip or some other pain in your lung or, oh, get on with it, I've a couple of paracetamol, it'll be gone tomorrow. So I just think it's the awareness as well more than anything else. If you feel any lumps or if you don't feel very well, you've got to get straight to your GP. You've got to get an appointment because any early detection of an illness, it, it can save your life. The problem that I had, I'd waited four years with my... With, with uh, my my um, the tumor, yeah, and I allowed it to spread. I allowed it through my ignorance of my own health, you know. So don't do as I as I did, do as I say, yeah. you know. Um, and I brought a book out saying, "Please don't go." When, when I was really ill, my father, I fainted, and and I came out of the hospital, I'm ripping all the wires out. My, you know, um, I had a really bad morning, and my father's there saying, "Please don't go, son," and all that. So it's quite poignant at the time so I brought a book out as well which um, people have said to me since you know your book is you know I read your book and it, it saved my life because I went I read it I've got a little lump on my testicle and that that book sort of urged me to go you know so that's pleasing as well that you can help in your own little way you know what's the people. book called please don't go please don't go yeah and I checked that out yeah it's a good book it's a very emotional book um We'll get get your pack of the hankies. I ready will. For that. I will. I will. <laughs> no, but you've had you've had an amazing, amazing life, and it's not just like we say. It's not just all rosy, is it? You know, because mm, you've had not. you've had battles on many fronts, and 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 like you know, you had a problem with your gambling addiction as well. Yeah. yeah. You know that went on th- throughout your career. Do, do you think the cancer uh, battle, which mm. was over like 11, 12 years ago, do you think mm. that helped you kick the gambling addiction? Because that was only 10 well. Years, interestingly it? enough, it's like. By me gambling and by me having a divorce and by me um, being the way that I was didn't help my um, my stress levels in terms of bringing on the cancer. Because they do say, like, stress is, is a common thing that can bring on cancers. 
if you're stressed and anxiety and you've got, you've got mental health problems, which many people have, that, that can almost be a trigger, you know, to bring on other illnesses. And so I was under that sort of type of place in my life where, you know, I was traveling and playing for West Brom and um, back and forth to Wales, seeing my children, all this sort of stuff. And, um, and I, no doubt about it, that, that played heavy on everything else going on. You know, with with the the lumps on my testicles, and and it speeded up. Then it it sped up very quickly, and I was I was in hospital then fighting for my life. So, but the gambling, the gambling, I'd I'd always had a, an issue with gambling. I'd I'd always loved gambling, ever since I was um, a youngster working in a social club collecting glasses. I'd play on the fruit machines, and people would call me when they had nudges and go and get John. He's collecting glasses. I wasn't a young kid, ten, eleven years of age. And I'd help them, and I, I, I just got really into it. And, and gambling is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in society, not not just in sport. They reckon half of every single football team gambles. There's more people that take their life through gambling addiction than any other addiction. So uh, in 2011, um, I, I made a decision. My wife threatened to leave me. She'd pack the bags. She'd pack the children's bags. And that was my rock bottom. And any addiction will tell you, any addictive person who's really involved and he's, he's, he's got a gambling addiction or a drug addiction or an alcohol or a sex or a gaming or an eating or a dieting, there's so many different types of addictions. Um, a lot of them say you have to hit that rock bottom place, you know, to, to really think, well, I'm in such a dark hole. I, I, can, only, I, can, only, I can only come out of this. I can't go any lower. I can't go any darker, you know. And I hit that place. And I... Uh, Can you describe it for us, like? Yeah, I'd been out. I'd been out all afternoon, taking another liberty with my wife. Um, and I had a three-story house in Swansea. And uh, I come home one particular night. Um, and I stayed in the middle floor with a bedroom on the middle floor. And my wife used to be in the top floor with the, the kids, two of the bedrooms. The other daughter of mine was in the same floor as mine on the middle floor. So I jumped in the middle floor, uh, which I do quite a bit when I, you know, got drunk and whatever else and I had an argument and things like that. So in the morning, I can remember hearing a load of banging, like coming down the stairs. And I thought, oh, I've got six hours kept. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> so my wife burst in the room and she had two suitcases. And she said, I'm going. She said, I've booked flights. I'm going back up to... Um, Scotland, when, where her parents were. She said, I love you so much. She said, I can't sit back and watch you doing what you're doing to yourself. It's killing me. It's killing her to see me doing this all the time, to telling lies, um, being deceitful, gambling, losing everything. It was horrific. It was that, that's the life I was living, you know, and John Artson probably earned millions in his career it's a silent addiction, really, the gambling. Because if you're if you're drunk and if you're on drugs, you're noticeable. But you could just lose a lot of money and act the same. You know, nobody really knows with the gambling. Um, but it's eating you up inside. It's not so much on the outside. Mental health is, is what's going on in there. Do you know that affects you? So she said, "I'm going to go." She said, "I'm taking the kids with me." So that was it. That was my rock bottom at that particular time and I just thought what am I doing you know I gotta go, I gotta you know I don't know what to do like what type of money was you gambling it weren't big numbers but it, it was consistent you know I'd, I'd gambled every day and I, I had accounts and I had I had account with William Hill and account with Ladbrokes I had account with Sunderland's I had account with yeah. Stan James I had account with Betsy's you know, and if I'd run one card down, I'd have another card. And it was just, it was just ridiculous. It was stupid. Um, but I was an addict. I was an addict. I wasn't a bad person. You know, addictions are like, if if your children is crying there and he wants an ice cream and you've got a chance to put a bet on, you'll get a bet on, not because you're bad or because you're nasty. It's because the addiction's so strong. It takes over. It's ridiculous. You know, so I made a decision that day. It was It was October the 5th. 2011, it was a Sunday. You even remember the day. Did and uh, and my wife said to me, right? She said, you get on that computer, 
because I'm not doing it. Like, I do everything for you. She says, and you look for a GA, a Gamblers Anonymous. And I got on a computer, and it was a GA in Swansea on that Sunday night, and it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I phoned them up, and I said, hello there, um, I've got a gambling problem. Is it okay if I come along to the meeting tonight? And the answer back was, absolutely, everybody's welcome. Uh, you do know here that it's all private confidential. Uh, we we like it if none of this was... was um, was spread in terms of what what you hear you what you say here. I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, Perfect. so I go into the room, uh, GA, and then there's lots of people sitting around the table. It's it's a it's a it's an anonymous so gamble GA uh, on a Sunday. There's GA on a Tuesday. There's AA. You know, different meetings. It's in this sort of uh, community centre, and I just kept going. I just kept going. I was so. You know, I'd go two meetings a week. Uh, sorry, three meetings a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. And I didn't miss a meeting for about four years. My wife would come. She'd sit in the other in the room called Gammonon with the wives and the girlfriends of the men. They would discuss the problems, um, why we bet, why we act the way we do. Um, so That's then, good for the wives as well. Absolutely. Isn't it? They, their they, way, they their get, way out, their red, you know, their red flags and stuff. And yeah, they get an understanding of why their husbands are doing this all the time. Why are they letting them down? Why are they letting the kids down? Why are you doing this to yourself? You know, because they don't know, because they're not addicts. You know, they just love you for what you are, you know, mm. even though you're a, you know, um, and I just knuckled down, and like everything else, I think you've got to take it serious. I think you've got to do it right. You've got to change your way of living. You know, you've got to, your money side of things has to be looked after. Um, you've got to do the 12 steps. You've got to be consistent with the meetings. You've got to have a good mindset. Uh, and you've got to want to do it. You've got to, for, for you, for you. Not for her, for you. Isn't it? Absolutely right, because if you're right... If I'm right, everybody's right around me. My wife is okay, my children, because I'm right, you know. Daddy's okay now, daddy's good, you know, things like that. I got to make myself, she can't make me right. She can't go for me. I've got to go and discipline myself and educate myself on this on this addiction, you know. Um, illness. So uh, I went and um, October the 5th, 2021 last year I was 10 years clean and I've uh, I've not bought a raffle ticket um thank you I've not not placed a bet um and my life has just changed dramatically you know in terms of my focus what's important to me I'm wise to picking people that I want to be with um my family have helped me so much my wife Sarah has been there for me every day uh and now I'm in a good place. I, I don't I don't think about gambling at all. Cheltenham was on last week and I was like, I wouldn't watch it if it was out my back garden. No disrespect <laughs> to the gamblers. They want to go. And remember, gambling's meant to be fun. A lot of people gamble and they can they can yeah. have fun and everything else. And that's absolutely fine. I've not got an issue at all with that, people gambling. Um but for me, it's it's been the most important thing and the biggest thing that I've ever done in my life, because it's not only saved my life. It's gave me a life. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's gave me a life being clean and being able to focus and having friends and concentrate on, on, on what I want to do with my life. Gambling is, it controls addictions, control every single minute, every every hour, every day, every week of your life. You know, if, if you're a drug addict. Do you look addict, at everything as like a gamble, a bet, everything? Well, when I was gambling, it was just the first thing I thought of. If I get out of bed, can I have a bet? Where am I going to get my money from? Who can I borrow off? Let's go, let's go and have a bet. I'd sit in the bookmakers all day and just eat sausage rolls and cans of Coke. And Really? Yeah, just bet. Just bet on the horses, bet on the, you know, the... Well, I could go down to, like, the local bet thread and see John Harton sat at the yeah, fucking table. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. fucking mad. And I didn't care, because I've always yeah. been... I, I don't care, John Hartson. I've, I've not got an ego. No. I'm from a council estate in Swansea, like a lot of us, you know. Um, and my dad always said to me, "Just I'll go down to Swansea and I'll, I'll nip up my local pub and have a game of darts with the boys. I'll have a game of pool, you know. My father always said to me, "Just he said, you'll have many ups and downs during your life and during your career. 
wise words. He says, don't get too high with the highs. He says, and don't get too low. He says, try and just keep that. Yeah. And I never forgot them words. I've always been that way, very balanced. I've got time for everybody. Um, and, and humble and just normal. I just see myself as a normal boy. So that's probably to my detriment, got me in a few scrapes, got me into stupid things, you know, like the, you know, like saying about Cardiff, like saying about this, and like saying about that and just making headlines. And maybe, I, you know, because I never saw myself as somebody up there or out there, you know, people put me on a pedestal. Oh, there's John Hartson, there, a couple of builders there driving around, looking at my car. John, there, what's he doing in Cardiff? Yeah, yeah, I see but that. I'm like, I just drive I see <laughs> and I wind the window down, and they either look at me like they want to spit in my face, or they want to come over and say hello. Do you know, you get that reaction, you know. But that's, that's I think like, ninety percent of them want to say hello. Don't yeah, you know probably, I mean? yeah, probably, of course, yeah. But for all the time, you know, come to the St David's Center and meeting a couple of mates in Cardiff, and you know, going for lunch and all. That. I've, I've never had one person. Um, I think you know, you never even played for them, you know, so. No, but I've if never, Lee Trundle was caught down, it'd be a different ball game. Yeah, I but think. genuinely, I've never, I've never had any issues. Nobody's ever come on to me. I've never had any, you know, any abuse or nothing like that. It's different when it's twenty thousand in a in a crowd, isn't it? You know, it's like, you know, if, if you know, normally that group element, you know, only takes one to shout someone, yeah, yeah, and they yeah, all yeah. get behind it. Then of course they do, it's, yeah. it's like, uh, but no, as I said. Um, you know, when you said there about going down the bookies, and I didn't think nothing. I'd sit with the old boys and have a bet all day. Mm. That's that's the place I was in, you know. That's the way, mate. That's the way. So where, where are you at the moment then, John? You seem like you're in a good place. I'm mate. in a great place mentally. I'm good. I'm down now in Cardiff for a few days. I love doing the S4C, the Welsh speaking games. I just feel as if I'm just giving something back as well to the Welsh public. Yeah, she, you know, I could, I could do games for Sky and things like that, but I like doing them for the Welsh language. S4C... I covered the Welsh Premier before I went up to the BBC and then up to Edinburgh and did more bigger gigs. And um, But I love doing them. I love doing them. We've been really successful as a nation. We've kept, you know, we've um, the last two Euros we've reached and the team uh, are looking good. Um, so I'm in a good place. Uh, my wife is fantastic. I've got five kids, four daughters. Um, I love Edinburgh, great place to you know to bring children up. Love coming back, seeing my parents in Swansea and my brother. And they in good health? Good, they're in good, yeah, and in really good health. I went to see my sister, to, I lost my sister six months ago, so I took flowers to her gravestone this morning. Unfortunately, she, she died suddenly with a heart attack. She yeah, was only 47. It's horrendous. So my parents are still struggling with that, you know, and without going into it too much. Um so I fill my time. I'm going to go up now and meet a few of the guys um, from the, you know, from the crowd, the S4C crowd, yeah. you know, and producers and everything else. We'll run through a few games and stuff this afternoon, yeah. do, do our prep properly. I'm very much looking forward then to going to the Cardiff City Stadium tomorrow night and uh, and I'm praying that we get through. I'm praying that we win the game and set up that, that game then, you know, later on in the year. And it'd be fantastic, I think, for the country and the football side of things, if, yeah. if Wales can get to a World Cup. We've not been there for over 60 years, a World Cup. So what an achievement it would be. We've been know? knocking the door though for, for some time now. Knocking on the door, yeah. We yeah, did. The we Euros have. last time was special, weren't they? And I was talking, I remember, I was talking to Bellamy the other week about when that little run we had when we beat Italy and Argentina, because right. you was playing as well, didn't you? I was. I went to them games. They were some great runs, they were. Well, I remember Danny Gabbard on plastic the ball into me, Gabs. I love Gabs, great guy. He played the ball into me. I was on the halfway. I've got Carnivaro and Nesta hanging off my back against Italy, right? So I turn and I play Bellas through and he hasn't got to break his stride, Bellas, right? And he went round the goalkeeper, Buffon, and he slotted the ball in and we all chased after him. Do you know Bellas has never said thank you for that pass? <laughs> <laughs> He's waiting. But, uh, he was fantastic to play with. He was fantastic to play with. Um running behind his standards were unbelievable. Um so a uh, great, great player, Craig, and uh, we always had always got on really well. Yeah. I got some questions here for you, just some quick fire ones. Well the kind of names actually. Mm. One or two questions. Um first of all, I just these are just players okay. you probably come across with. So I just want to let honest honest answer about him. Tony Adams. Brilliant monster. Um man amongst men. 
proper leader, proper captain, captain of Arsenal and England at 23, 24. And when I first went to Arsenal, um, I was amazed by his leadership. He, he, George Gray wouldn't speak in the dressing room. Tony Adams would speak, the captain. He'd go around addressing the players. And we all looked up to him so much. And I admire him because when I was at the club, um, he had an accident and he put it down to the, the drinking. And uh, Tony came in one day and he said, he lined us all up against the wall. And he said, look, lads, I've got something to say to you all. And it was typical Tony. He said, uh, he said I'm an alcoholic, he said. <laughs> lined you up against the last man. And I'd like, I'd like your help. He said, no, let's go and train. And from that day, I believe he's not a drink. And the people that he's helped is nobody's business in terms of setting up his clinic, the Sporting Chance. Young men, young footballers. It's based down in Forest Mead in Southampton. It's, um, and he's helped so many, you know, with all types of addictions. What a man, you know, an England captain, wonderful player, hard as nails. And as I said, I've probably got as much admiration for him for what he's done. Do you need a work uniform? Want to start a clothing brand? Or maybe you have a football kit that needs a logo printed? Well, if I was you, I'd get in touch with the Reinspire Printing Company down to Forest Industrial Estate for the finest printing and embroidery in Wales. I use them for my custom-made mankini. But you could use them for T-shirts, hats, hoodies, and many, many other things. And even when he was captain of England and captain of Arsenal, and when I was playing under him and listening to him address the team and point the finger and give you praise and he was just just an incredible human being he's not in the, like i don't see him much in the eye no more is he just like staying away from football and i don't sense, know or? really i don't know i did a conference thing with tony a few years ago um in oxford in a big conference suite i was talking about my recovering gambling programs and tony was doing the alcohol programs and we met up there and we exchanged numbers and and that was it. And and do you know what? I, I don't really, without sounding rude or arrogant, I don't speak to Bell Bellas for two years. And then he'll phone me and he'll say, John, I'm in Cardiff, are you about? Because he'll see me in, in on the telly and we'll have a bit of lunch. I don't speak to Burkamp. I don't speak to Ian Wright. People think, I think a lot of people think, because you played with Your these mates, guys. Yeah. yeah, I've got my mates who I grew up with. You know, I've got I've got real good mates that were there with me, you know, stood shoulder to shoulder with me, followed me all around the country when I was playing, yeah, used yeah. to come and watch me. And yeah, I've got a lot of time. I bump into these guys whenever I bump into Paul Merson. We have a cuddle. I was, how's it going, Merson? How's the family? But yeah, and, we, and then we just go, and that's it. You know, so I don't really speak to Tony much, but when I see him, it's great to catch up for that 10 minutes, you know? Of course, yeah. Okay, uh, Ryan Giggs. Giggs here, well, I played with Ryan, didn't I, for 10 years. Um, <laughs> I played with Ryan. Yeah, um, but um, as I said, he was a phenomenal player. I, I don't want to get into the, the personal issues that Ryan's dealing with now because I don't think that would be very fair, uh, probably inappropriate of me to do that. When I don't know the, you know the, the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts of what's happening and everything else. Um, but as I said, when I played with him, he was great to be with. Uh, he was a phenomenal player, obviously. Um, you know, so as I said, I had a lot of respect for him when he was at United and everything else. I'd play against him and things like that. And then he took over the Welsh job. Uh, he was doing doing very well, I yeah, thought, was, as a manager, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and as I said, he, he was an incredible player. But I, I would probably have to leave it that, probably for legal reasons as well. I don't want to say things about certain situations that would probably get yeah, me get yeah. me in hot water. Um, all right, then, Gary Speed. Well, Speed was incredible. Um, I miss him even today, you know. Um, it's so sad that he decided to take his life the way that he did. Um, I think Wales is still grieving. Still grieving, because Gary was just a brilliant person. Like the drink, like the game of golf, loved the lads. Just amazing and an incredible football player. His career um, was willing to go left back for Wales under Mark Hughes, one of the best midfield players in the country. For the team, he went and played left back to get our midfield in like he did. So that says a lot about him. 
he could have just gone, no chance, I'm, I'm captain, I want to stay in the midfield. Yeah. Poses Sparky a problem then. Um, I travelled the world with Speedo. I knew his mum and dad, Carol and Roger. I knew Eddie and Tommy, his sons. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, it, it's really sad to think that uh, whatever he was going through, he, he, he couldn't share that. You know, he couldn't share that and, and didn't really reach out. You know, um, because Gary would have helped anybody out. That's the type of man he was. And it was a shame when he had a few problems, obviously, that he never asked anybody. And yeah. they say, you, you've got to try and talk about these problems and talk to someone. You know, It's surprising to come. And anybody would have been there for Speedo. He had so mm. much um, respect of everybody. But as I said, uh, it, it's so sad and a devastation, really, for, for everybody involved with Gary, his parents and... Um, I went up to see Roger, went to the funeral, obviously, and uh, lots of people were really tight with Speedo. He was everybody's friend, great guy. Such a such a sad loss. Um, finally, Henrik Larsson. Henrik, again, unbelievable player. I would say the two best players I ever played with in my career <laughs> was Larsson and Burkamp. And I was lucky I was lucky to play with Hughes, Giggs. Um, uh, I played with... Uh, what's this called? I got, um, I got, I got a question for you in a minute. About yeah, I played with so many good players: <laughs> Merson, Adams, you know, Wright, um, Bellamy. These guys, Hughes, Rush, you know, Speed. I, I was very lucky to have played, you know, Sutton. Sutton, yeah, great players, you know, Golden Thompson. Boot winners, Tomo, Lenny, great team at Celtic, you know. Um, but if I had to say two that were on a different level. You know, I mean, I mean, there's levels. There's levels in boxing. There's levels in every sport. You know, in terms of football, there's levels. And Burkamp and Larson were on that highest grade, you know. Um, so I always say that. Phenomenal talent, goal scorer. He had absolutely everything. And the biggest thing about him was his attitude. He wanted to better himself, never rested on his laurels. If he'd scored three goals... In the 89th minute, he's chasing the goalkeeper down. Selig at 3-0 up. He just wants to score four. He wants to score five. And I learned a lot from Henrik, playing with him for, for three or four years up at Celtic. He was an incredible, great person. Um, and it just goes to show, he left Celtic and then he went and played for Manchester United and then he won the Champions League with Barcelona. Unbelievable. So yeah, when you think I about know. it, yeah. You thought his, I, I genuinely thought his career was like, like that when he when he went to Manu. Yeah, but he know? loved Celtic. He he really embraced Glasgow. They loved him. The King of Kings is his is his nickname, and his record is phenomenal. And he was great with the people up there. Had so much time for the Celtic fans while he was there, and he was a superstar. Um, and they still sing his name to today. You know, he's he's right yeah. up there in terms of uh, you know the great players of of the past, the Jimmy Johnsons and the Billy McNeils. Henrik Larsson is, is held in such high regard up there for Celtic. One more person I will mention quickly, mm -hmm. because I know you did have um, a lot of stint with him when he went up there, Roy Keane. Yeah, Roy was great. Yeah, Roy, um, I listen to Roy now on the television and, you know, he's, uh, he's very straight, very honest. Um, says it as it is. I think that's why the TV companies they probably him, yeah. pay him 10 times more than anybody else because you know what they're going to get from Roy. You ask him a straightforward question, he's going to give it to you. He doesn't matter what, what papers write about him. I think he's got thick skin and he's yeah. really bothered. Um, he says what he says. He had a wonderful career. He can back it up, you know, with, with his medals hole and everything else. Yeah. And, and he was great, Roy. He was, um, he was good with me. We shared a dressing room like for six months and then I eventually played in his testimonial Celtic v Man United, um, love Celtic, you know, Republic of Ireland, legend. Um, so, you know, Roy was great. No problems at all with Roy, good lad. Okay, then, who's your dream partner up top? We spoke about Larson being one of the best. Who's your dream partner? My dream partner, take away Larson. I played with Henrik and I played with Burkamp. So we'll take away them two. My partner, for me, I would love maybe to have played with, um, probably would have been Rooney. Really? You take away Larson and Burkamp, Wayne Rooney could do everything. You know, he's just, he's just, he's just you know, highest goal scorer for this country, highest goal scorer for Manchester United. 
You know, that's some feet, by the way. Um, it's a mean-looking front to it. I love the <laughs> I love the Rooney documentary. I just thought he, he he showed up to be brilliant, tough as nails, all heart. Um, you know, and, and his achievements were like nothing else. Unbelievable. And, and actually, at Derby now, you know, with the points deduction and all that, everything else, if he manages to keep Derby up, then he deserves another job. I just feel in management sometimes people get jobs from going out of a job or not doing well there, but because they've had an experience, even a bad experience, they'll get another job. But for someone like Wayne Rooney, if he gets Derby out of the situation they're in, he would, for me, deserve another job. You know, that's the difference in deserving yeah. a job than just getting, getting a, a job or, or just being a, partic- a particular fit for a job. Yeah. He would have earned it. Now, how many managers can you actually say earn a job, come out of a brilliant job that they've done, won something, you know, took, took the team forward, made players better? Not many managers then no. go into another job after that. There's a, there's a few that are. But there's so many that don't. Does not. <laughs> yeah. Five, uh, dream five-a-side team who you played with. Who were your top, you know, who would well, you have I, with you? I, again, it would be a choice between Nev or David Seaman. Nev, the best keeper in the world in the 80s. David Seaman, probably the best keeper in the world 90s. in the 90s. England, no, no, a goalkeeper. Um, not a bad start, is it? I'd, I'd go Neville Southall in goal. Then I'd go, I'd go Adams. I'd go... Burkamp, Larson, Giggs, and um, Janinho, who came, I played with Janinho at Celtic. He came, yeah, Brazilian, obviously the great Brazilian Janinho. Yeah. From Middlesbrough, he, he was he? Tricky, yeah, Middlesbrough. So I think I need six there. I'd leave myself out. Yeah, you're the coach, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, it's a wicked five aside, that, yeah. isn't it? Great, Can't fault it. Top. Top, oh, I'll say this one final, actually. Hardest teammate? Hardest teammate, I would say Mick Arford. Mick Arford at Luton. Uh, Mick was oof, incredible, tough. Arms the size of your legs. <laughs> Bony. Yeti. Yeah, chin, like that. Um, and renowned in the game for being physically aggressive. A lovely gentleman, Mick. He's doing the recruitment now for Nathan Jones at Luton. He's a Luton legend, uh, working with Nathan closely. They're doing really well, third in the championship. Uh, so um, Mick Arford, I'd have to say, in terms of a teammate, you know, I played with Vinny, of course, for the, Hardest, nas- yeah. for the national team. Mark Hughes was a monster. Sparky would kick his granny to win a tackle, you know. He was he was so aggressive and he'd stamp on people's toes and he'd back in and show his strength. Sparky Hughes was Keown, nice. I've seen Martin Keown Martin talk about Martin well. I, I used to room with Martin. We used to do it. Martin used to say to me, right, John, when we go out to training today, me and you today, we roommates, we'll do it for real. He says, we'll play like this is a game. He says, because I can guarantee you that you won't come up against anybody tougher, quicker, stronger than me. (laughs) Anywhere, no matter who you play against. Because Martin, Villa, Everton, Arsenal, England, tough as nails, and we would hit the living daylights out of each other. We'd have to be separated because we did it as if it was real. Look, balls in the air. I'm on a match day. I'm going to cross. I'm one, two, three. He's coming from behind, whacking me. And we had to be like, boys, what are you doing? It's training. But I felt I was 19 and I always felt, what an education. Great. What an education to, to learn that from Martin. And that's what he used to say. Treat it like it's a game. Not a little training session where you don't touch each other or Not pe- people jump out of, you know, tackles. And he says, we'll go for it today. You know, and uh, we used to as well. Uh, finally, top top career, top three career moments, or co- defining moments. Well, the, the number one for me is representing my country, being playing for Wales. You know, I'm taking that number nine shirt. You, you look at the players that had worn it before me. Um the likes of Rush, Saunders, Hughes, John Charles, Trevor Ford, great players. And I always think that you, you can't go higher than represent your country. Can't go higher because you're representing your nation, your heritage, your grandfather, your father, your children. You know, standing there and we've all got children. So 
your parents must be up there thinking, I can remember my son kicking a ball around the street when he was six, seven years of age with aspirations of being a footballer, being a professional footballer and then representing his country. Yeah, it's always the final. So it's like, you're doing it for them. I'm doing it for my brother, my sisters who used to come to the games and and you can't go can't go any better. I was very fortunate. I played Champions League. I played in the Premier League. I won individual honours. But I played for Celtic, a global institution of a club, Arsenal. But playing for Wales was my number one. You know, as I said, it, it's the best thing I've ever achieved in my life is representing my country at senior level. Brilliant. So he's number one then. He's number one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If any, any got, I, I don't know if I've got a two or a three. To be honest, um, that's amazing. Obviously, I play, the country. playing for Celtic. I could have gone to Middlesbrough. I chose Celtic. Um, playing under Martin O'Neill, who took a risk with me on my knee. You know, showed his faith in me. Gave me a five-year contract, and then coming back with 110 goals for Celtic. Um, Unbelievable. You know, so probably playing for representing that club. You know, it's it's. I can't go anywhere in the world, as I said earlier, without bumping into a Celtic fan. Yeah. Anywhere in the world, you know, and Rangers are the same. They're absolutely huge institutions. So obviously representing that club and probably 19 years of age going to Arsenal. Yeah. I'm still a kid at 19, really. You've not really seen anything or... You're 19 years of age, you know, three years earlier, I'm still living in my parents' house, 16. So at 19 then, I'm going out at Highbury and I'm playing with these England internationals in front of 50,000 people at Highbury or whatever it was. Um, so I'll probably have to say those things. And of course, the more important thing was to, to get through the cancer. I think your health is number one. I think trust is number two. Where there's no trust, there's nothing. Got to have trust. Um, and for me, your health is number one. Takes so Without your health, then, you know, there's no point being here you, you've got to have your health um sort of come through cancer and obviously to watch my children grow up uh, and being in that situation where I was lucky and I'm very very grateful uh it's changed me a lot you know coming through that in terms of my my attitude and my mindset and everything so I can't say three biggest things that have happened in my life um without mentioning getting getting over cancer and coming through it you know uh, and obviously the gambling as well and there's loads. I could go on all day. Unbelievable. You know? Yeah. Honestly, John, apart from the fucking drilling, what's been going on next door, <laughs> I have loved every fucking moment <laughs> ah, of this. Good stuff. So have no, I, Honestly, so honestly have I. John, it's been amazing. Brilliant, mate. Honestly, nice thank one. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, is there anything you'd like to say down to the camera, to the people watching, anything inspiring, maybe if anyone's going through any battles or they're worried about anything? Mm. Anything you'd like to say down there? Well, like, listen, just don't don't hold it in. I think it's important to talk. Um, it's important to share things. Um, like a problem shared is almost a problem solved. You know, that's that's the saying that they say. But listen, I'm no genius. I'm, I'm no expert. I just, somebody who just got on with it and tried to do the right thing. I've made mistakes in my life. Um, I'll probably make more. And um, no, not at all. But as I said, I hope when you when you watch this that uh, you'll take something for it, even if it, even from it, even if it's one thing. So thanks again. Honestly, thank you so much. Cheers, John. pal. Welcome, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, I'll see you all soon. Stay central. <laughs> Stay central. <laughs> the Central Club.